In this episode, we'll look at how modern LLMs are built using parts of the original transformer architecture that we looked at in the previous episode. There are two main types of LLMs we can build from a transformer, encoder-based like BERT and decoder-based like GPT. And of course, we have hybrid models that use both the encoder and the decoder. In a way, the original transformer is an example of such model. In this episode, we'll specifically focus on encoder-based LLMs, while the next episode will focus on decoder-based LLMs such as GPT, Llama, Mistral, and so on. Now, I know that many of you are here to learn about GPT, and I was tempted to skip encoder-based LLMs altogether and jump directly into GPT, as that video will get way more views than this one. But I want LLM Chronicles to reflect the way I enjoy learning. That is, I don't just want to study the final product. I like to see how we got there, what's the story, what we tried, what worked, what are the alternatives. I find this much more rewarding and it really helps me understand and appreciate why things are in a certain way and how they could be different. So without any further ado, let's get started by recapping the key elements of the transformer architecture. In 2017, Google introduced the transformer architecture for language translation. Transformers use two components, the encoder and the decoder. The decoder processes the entire input sequence at once, generating hidden representations. These hidden representations capture the overall sentence meaning and how words relate to each other. The decoder can then take these representations and generate the translated sentence, one word or token at a time. The decoder takes as input all the tokens it has generated so far and produces the next token. We call this an autoregressive model. The encoder and the decoder are actually quite similar from an architectural perspective. The building blocks are pretty much the same. The difference is mainly in the role and function that we assign them as part of the bigger model. The role of the encoder is to generate rich representations of an input sentence, and it considers all input tokens, while the role of the decoder is to generate text one token at a time. This means that we can take either the encoder or the decoder separately to build language models for different tasks. Encoder-based models like BERT are generally better at classification tasks. Decoder-based models like GPT are more suited for text generation tasks. I want to spend a couple of minutes now looking at the differences between encoder and decoder-only models. This is the key to understanding the different foundations of modern LLMs. In a decoder-only model like GPT, the cross-attention layer is not present because there's no encoder output to attend to, so we effectively drop the cross-attention component from the architecture. This makes the encoder and the decoder blocks very similar. The only real difference remains in their self-attention mechanism. The decoder uses masked self-attention, so the hidden representations at each step are only influenced by the previous steps. Whereas in the encoder, each hidden representation of an input token considers all other input tokens, before and after. So we can say that these encoder representations have a bi-directional context. The other key difference is in terms of output configuration. The encoder simply outputs hidden representations that capture the original sentence meaning, nothing else. The decoder has additional layers at the end to output a probability distribution across the dictionary that we can use to sample the next token in the sequence we are generating. 
Another way of looking at this is that the output of the decoder is already in natural language and immediately useful for us as it's just natural language. Instead, the output of the encoder is still a hidden representation that needs further processing. In theory, we could easily adapt the encoder for text generation by adding a module to map hidden states to the size of the vocabulary. Likewise, we could remove the decoder's final layer and use its hidden states for representation. The main difference that would remain between the two is still in the self-attention layer. The hidden representations created by the decoder would still only be influenced by the previous tokens in the sequence, whereas those produced by the encoder are influenced by all tokens in the sequence, not just the preceding ones. And that is why, in practice, we tend to prefer the representations produced by the encoder for classification tasks, as they are richer than those produced by the decoder. Let's now tackle the next big idea at the basis of language models, the concepts of pre-training and fine-tuning. Transformers are very powerful, but they can only perform one very specific task that they've been trained on, that is translating from one language to another, or more generally from one sequence to another. This training requires a large dataset that is very specific to this task, the original 2017 Transformer was trained on a French-English dataset containing 36 million sentences. What if we want to train models to perform other natural language tasks, such as sentiment analysis, summarization, paraphrasing, question and answer? The challenge is that we'd need to create large training sets with task-specific data. However, these task-specific datasets are expensive and time-consuming to create. The solution is to first add a self-supervised pre-training phase. In pre-training, the model can learn effective representations of language basically on its own. For this, we need to come up with one or more pre-training tasks that lend themselves well to self-supervised learning. That is, learning from large amounts of unlabeled text. Large amounts of unlabeled text are relatively easy to obtain, for example by scraping the internet. After the model has been pre-trained, we can then fine-tune it on a specific downstream task using a much smaller task-specific dataset. This is exactly how language models like BERT and GPT work. BERT is an encoder-based LLM introduced by Google in 2018. In order to learn about language and concepts, BERT is pre-trained to perform two tasks, masked language modeling and next sentence prediction. In masked language modeling, we randomly mask words in a sentence and BERT is trained to predict these masked words. In practice, some input tokens are randomly masked with a special mask token and fed into the model. For each masked token, the corresponding hidden representation produced by the last encoder layer is passed through an additional feedforward neural network that acts as a classifier. The classifier projects the hidden representation to the size of the model's vocabulary aiming to predict the original token. This means that the output for that masked token is a probability distribution across the entire vocabulary of what the masked word is likely to be. For next sentence prediction, BERT learns to predict whether two sentences naturally follow each other, which enhances its ability to understand the flow and relationships of ideas in text. Given two spans of text, the model predicts if these two spans appeared sequentially in the training data, outputting either is next or not next. The first span starts with a special token CLS for classify. The two spans are then separated by a special token SEP for separate, 
After processing the two spans, the first output vector, the one that corresponds to the CLS input token, is passed to a separate neural network for the binary classification into is next or not next. The key with encoder-based LLMs is that we have to add layers at the end specific for the task that we need to perform. After pre-training, we can then discard these additional layers as we only needed them for the pre-training tasks and we can keep all the train weights of the underlying encoder. So now this pre-trained encoder has a deep understanding of language and concepts thanks to the pre-training tasks, and we're now ready to fine-tune it for our actual desired tasks. To fine-tune an encoder, we append additional output layers at the end. The layer would take in the hidden representations, all of them or just a subset depending on the task, and map them to the shape required by the task. If you recall from our RNN episode, we spoke about different types of sequence-to-sequence -sequence tasks, such as many-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many. -many. The output layer that we add on top of the encoder will be specific to the type of task we want to perform. For example, a classification task is a many-to-one task, taking a sequence of words or sentence as input and producing a class as an output. Say we want to classify the sentiment of a restaurant review. The review can be positive, neutral, or negative. So we simply add a classifier layer to map the hidden representations to one hot encoded outputs for the three sentiment classes. However, this is a many to one task. So we have many hidden representations, one for each token of a review, and we want to map it to a single sentiment. Which of these hidden representations do we input in the final classifier layer? Remember the CLS token that was added during the pre-training on next sentence prediction? For classification tasks, we can use this CLS token. This is because this token's representation is rich in contextual information about the whole input sentence. For completeness, and to see something a little bit different, let's now consider a many-to-many -many task. For example, named entity recognition. Named entity recognition consists in categorizing key information in text into predefined categories such as the names of persons, organization, locations, etc. For this task, BERT processes each token of the input sentence and assigns it a label indicating its category. This requires a different output layer compared to the classification task. We add a token classification layer that learns to assign a label to each input token. So, if we feed a sentence like John traveled to Paris, BERT would output labels indicating John as a person and Paris as a location. When we fine tune BERT, there are two main strategies during back propagation. We can update all of BERT's weights, or we can just update the weights of the extra layers that we added to perform the specific task. Updating all the weights allows to tailor the entire model to the specific task, which can lead to better performances. However, it's more computationally intensive and time consuming, and it can also increase the risk of overfitting, particularly with small data sets. On the other hand, freezing pre-trained weights saves computational resources and training time, and also reduces the risk of overfitting. Plus, it allows the same pre-trained base model to be reused for different tasks by adding unique layers for each one. The disadvantage of freezing the base model weights during fine-tuning is that this might limit how well the model adjusts to the task, possibly impacting its performance. 
the choice between these strategies depends on factors such as dataset size, available computational resources, and the need for task-specific model optimization versus the efficiency of deploying multiple models. In the months and years after its initial release, many models have been developed based on BERT's architecture. Let's see some notable examples. Roberta is an optimized version of BERT that tweaks the training process for better performance. Distill BERT is a smaller, faster version of BERT that retains 97% of its language understanding capabilities while being 40% lighter and 60% faster. Albert focuses on reducing the model size significantly without sacrificing performance, addressing the memory consumption issue of BERT. When talking about some of these models derived from BERT, we did mention that, for example, Distilled BERT retains 97% of its language understanding capability. But how do we actually measure that? Unlike simpler models where metrics such as accuracy, precision, and recall might be enough, evaluating language models requires a more sophisticated approach. And this is where benchmarks such as Glue and Squat come into play. The Glue benchmark is a collection of different tasks that require natural language understanding. These tasks include question answering, sentiment analysis, text, similarity, and other challenges designed to assess a model's grasp of language. Models like BERT are evaluated based on their performance across all these tasks, with the results aggregated into a single score. The score reflects the model's overall language understanding capabilities. BERT achieved a score of 80.5% on GLUE, obtaining new state-of-the-art results at that time. Another benchmark used to evaluate BERT was SQUAD, which contains 100,000 crowdsourced question-answer pairs. Given a question and a passage from Wikipedia containing the answer, the task is to predict correctly which part of the Wikipedia passage contains the answer. BERT achieved a score of 92.3% on SQUAD. Since the publication of BERT, we've seen more and more benchmarks for assessing language models. A notable one still used today to assess all major models is MMLU, Massive Multitask Language Understanding, which provides a wide range of specific tasks for deeper insights into a model's capabilities. In this episode, we covered how LLMs can be built using the encoder part of the Transformer architecture. We discussed the key idea of pre-training on unlabeled data and then fine-tuning on a smaller data set for a specific task. In the next episode, we'll explore GPT and you'll see how the key difference is in the way we can train it on downstream tasks. The fact that GPT already produces language means that we don't need to alter the structure by adding layers specific to a certain task. Now, this allows us to train it on many downstream tasks at the same time, ultimately obtaining powerful models that can perform any task we can ask in natural language. As usual, if you are enjoying LLM Chronicles and want to support the channel, please hit that like button and consider dropping a comment below. It really helps the YouTube algorithm understand that this is good content and it might propose it to other people, helping the channel grow, which will increase my motivation to make more videos. Making one of these videos, especially the explainer videos with all of the animations, actually takes a lot of time just to storyboard, design and implement. So I really appreciate your help. And if you're not subscribed yet, hit that subscribe button and I'll see you next time.